Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this beautiful Halloween afternoon. My name is Eric Arneson from George Washington University, and it is my pleasure to co-chair, or in this case, chair this session of the Washington History Seminar this afternoon. My co-chair, Christian Osterman, uh, is somewhere else on the globe, uh, engaged in his usual international travel on behalf of the Wilson Center. So I will do this solo. The Washington History Seminar, uh, some of you may know, some of you may not know, is a joint enterprise of the Woodrow Wilson Center and the National History Center of the American Historical Association. Um, its director, Dan Kennedy, uh, is sitting in the back. Um, and uh, uh, this has been a, th we think, thriving uh, endeavor uh, for the last uh, handful of years or so. In order to put a seminar like this on, we need support. Uh, and that support logistically is provided by a couple of terrific people, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center uh, and Amanda Moniz, uh, Amanda Moniz uh, from the Washington History Center. She is the uh, uh, associate director uh, of the center. We also like to thank the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations, Schaefer, which has generously underwritten this seminar uh, over the years. Uh, and we also benefit from the financial support of the George Washington University History Department uh, and a number of anonymous donors, uh, and we invite you to join their ranks uh, should you uh, so desire. Um, if we can ask if you have cell phones, that you turn them in the off uh, or vibrate uh, uh, position so that uh, we don't uh, have uh, interruptions uh, today. Our speaker this afternoon uh, is Tyler Anbinder, a colleague of mine and a professor of history at George Washington University who specializes in American immigration history and politics in the Civil War era. His first book, Nativism and Slavery, The, no no the Northern Know-Nothings and the Politics of the 1850s was published in 1992 uh, and won the Avery Craven Prize from the Organization of American Historians. His second book, Five Points, The 19th Century New York Neighborhood That Invented Tap Dance, Stole Elections, and Became the World's Most Notorious Slum, best subtitle ever, uh, published in 2001, uh, led to his work as an advisor to Martin Scorsese uh, on the gangs of New York. Today, uh, Tyler's uh, history uh, of immigrant life in New York City is the subject of his talk. It is the subject of his latest book, City of Dreams, the 400-year epic history of immigrant New York. Uh, and for the next 45 minutes, he will talk to us about that book, and then we will uh, have questions and discussions following. So, Tyler. Um, so anyway, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, thank you. Uh, Folks, for inviting me, and thank you for coming out on Halloween to, to hear about immigrant New York. Um, what I'm going to do, do is, this is the first talk I've given uh, about the book of any length, and it, it, it posed some dilemmas. How do you, in 45 minutes, uh, sum up a 700-page book? So, so as, as you'll see, I won't have a whole lot of time to talk about any one subject covered in the book, but I'll touch, I'm going to try to touch on virtually all of them, uh, and then you guys in the question and answer period can choose what parts you might want to talk about in more depth. Um, one thing I know that I have been asked at every stop I've made in the, in the uh, little book tour I've done so far is, is what made me, what inspired me to write such a book. So I thought I might start by, by answering that. Um, in part, I, I was inspired by the work I did on my, on my uh, previous books. Um, when I worked on, on my first book about the Know Nothing Party and, and American nativism, it made me feel like having written a book that told the story of immigration from those who opposed it and those who, who feared or hated the immigrants, that I wanted to do something that, that told the story from the immigrants' point of view. And I started out intending to do that just with that this one book about this one four by six block neighborhood in New York called Five Points. But as I worked on that, I felt like, you know, for every great story I would find about that tiny little neighborhood, I, I would find 10 other stories that I couldn't use because the people who were the protagonists in them didn't live in that little enclave. And so I started collecting so much good material that I thought uh, I ought to do something with it, and, and that was part of the genesis for this book. 
But in truth, I actually thought about this book um, even before I started writing Five Points. Um, I, I had this, you know, in thinking about, and I see just in the audience lots of very eminent scholars who have written books that I admire very much. And so when I was, you know, I guess when, when Five Points came out, I was, I was not quite 30 years old. And when I would think about my career in the future, I thought, you know, I, I looked at the, the, so many of these scholars, and they had written that, that one book that, that I just found so impressive. And I thought, all right, one day I want to write that impressive book that will make other people say, wow, how did he manage to do that? And so, so that was kind of the, the genesis for this book. Um, so it was really in, you know, by the fall of 19, by the spring of 1993, I had decided to do this, though I knew I needed to do it far in the future when I had accumul accumulated a lot more na knowledge. And then part of the reason that I had decided that was because it seemed like writing a monograph, you know, about a small topic like one small political party that lasted only a few years or one four by six block neighborhood, that seemed relatively easy, and I wanted a narrative challenge. I, I really love writing, you know, even though while I'm doing it, I'm often uh, very stressed out, and I, I can't sit still, and I have to pace the floor, and I have to eat lots of snacks because I, I can't come up with that right word or that, that way to get from this passage to that passage, that transition. But in the end, I love writing, and it seemed to me that this would be the greatest narrative challenge I could come up with for myself because it seemed like an impossible challenge. How do you tell the story of these you know, millions and millions of people and yet make it still a story, not make it an encyclopedia? That was my big fear. That was kind of the, the antithesis of what I wanted was something that was encyclopedic. Uh, so, so far I've been lucky with what, three or four reviews that, that have come out, nobody has called the book encyclopedic. And that's, that's kind of my goal is, is for no one to say that. Um, and I really wanted a story that had a beginning, a middle, and an end. I always tell, and i got a couple of my students here, I always tell my students that, that you know, your story has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end to, to keep the reader's interest. It can't be a collection of short stories. That's that not how historians usually write. And so that was my goal here, was, was that the story uh, had a progression, that it started somewhere, it progressed, and it had an, an end, although, as I say, at the very end of the book, it, it's kind of a never-ending story, but at least I do get the story to 2016. Um, so one of the ways I dealt with that narrative challenge was to have themes that would, would link the story together from the Dutch in the 1600s to today's immigrants. Uh, and yet I wanted to make sure that um, I didn't beat the reader over the head with those themes. You know those books? You've probably read those, those books where the theme is just front and center all the time. And I didn't want that at all. And so my goal was to, to, that the themes be subtle and yet unmistakable, that, that uh, they kind of be uh, something that you knew were there but, but weren't conscious of being told. But at the end, you couldn't help but having noticed them. And, and so I had... I think I would sum up uh, by saying that kind of three of those themes. Um, the first of those themes was that the immigrant experience has never varied much over the 400 years of New York's history, even though it, it seems on the surface that it must have. I mean, how could, how could the Dutch uh, living so long ago have, have been similar to the immigrants today who, who are in touch with their relatives uh, across the globe via the internet and Skype and and, and various things like that. And yet my, my feeling is that, that overall the immigrant experience really has not changed very much. Um, secondly, I feel like, and let's see, I have some, oops, wrong way. There we go, that's the one I wanted. Thank you. Do I push the up one or the, oh, oh, I see. I need to push to the right. Sorry about that. My fault. Um, so, so that the immigrant experience hasn't varied much. Second uh, theme, that anti-immigrant sentiment is as American as immigration itself. That 
the two have always gone hand in hand. You've never had immigration without having anti-immigrant sentiment. Um, that we tend to think, oh, today there is all this anti-immigrant animus, and, and it feels new to us. Um, and even to historians, it can feel new and different. Um, and certainly, in some ways, it's different. But for the but that anti-immigrant sentiment is as old as as immigration itself. And then third. Today's immigrants are not that much different than immigrants who came to the United States 100 or even 200 years ago. Um, we tend to think uh, that today's immigrants must be different, that today's immigrants aren't like my grandparents or great-grandparents or great-great-grandparents. Um, but my contention is that today's immigrants really are, in almost every way, in the areas where it really matters, like the immigrants of the past. So in order to tell this story, and in order to convey these themes, I made a couple of, of narrative decisions. Um, one was that I would use the biggest groups coming to New York to represent all immigrants in a given era in order to prevent narrative fragmentation. Um, you know, I mean, New York has today people who speak literally hundreds of languages. Um, the city has always had dozens of different immigrant groups. Uh, but I decided I, I, I didn't want to try to talk about all the immigrant groups in every period I covered, because that would just fragment the story too much, so that I would use the biggest groups to represent what was going on in the city at the time uh, and, and not try to talk about the 20th biggest immigrant group and the 21st biggest immigrant group and so forth. Then the other thing I decided was that I would use the stories of exemplary immigrants, and I don't mean exemplary like... Um, like we normally talk about, but literally as examples, that I would use immigrants, uh, exemplary immigrant stories, some very successful, some very unsuccessful, uh, but use their stories uh, told in depth to provide narrative glue that would hold the story, uh, the story of these millions of immigrants together. So that gives you a, an overview of what I tried. Um, and what I'll do in the, the 30 minutes I have left is is um, focus on those large immigrant groups who dominate the story uh, and, and kind of take you, through, uh, take you through what I did. So there's, there's New Amsterdam in the middle 1600s. Um, the color is probably not original, but the drawing actually, <laughs> the drawing actually is, is original and, and, and the original is, is, in, uh, uh, is in Europe still. Um, <clears throat> so one of the most interesting things I learned about the, the Dutch New York is uh, the story you tend to hear about why New York becomes this immigrant magnet that it becomes is that um, up in Puritan New England or in the southern colonies for that matter, um, they were much more homogeneous that, that in the middle colonies and especially uh, a place like New York, the Dutch, because of their you know, situation in where they are in Europe and being so small and having so, so much experience having to kind of trade with other peoples to, to bring about their, their uh, success and their prosperity, that the Dutch were more accepting of other people than the English say were, and that, that in part explains why you know, the middle colonies and, and New York in particular become so welcoming of, of immigrants. And, and what I was surprised to find was that really the Dutch weren't that much more welcoming of, of immigrants who weren't Dutch than were any other uh, Americans north or south. The big difference, however, though, was that New Amsterdam was governed indirectly by people in the Netherlands to a greater extent than was Massachusetts or, say, Virginia. And as a result, the people who governed New York who themselves, the people who were there in New Amsterdam, constantly wanted to keep everybody out who wasn't Dutch, and Dutch reform in particular. So not only did you have to be Dutch, you had to be Dutch reformed. Lutherans, no good. Other religions, you know, Dutch Jews, no good. They only wanted Dutch reform. But the people back in Amsterdam would send them letters and hearing about their efforts to try to exclude those groups and constantly tell them, no, you can't do that. Um, you need to accept the Lutherans. You need to accept the Jews. Quakers, maybe you didn't need to accept, but all the other groups you needed to accept. Um, 
And yet, what, what you have happening on the ground is that the Dutch who are actually in New Amsterdam find there's 3,000 miles of ocean. It takes months for a letter to get back and forth, and letters are the ways in which these, these instructions are being conveyed. And so the, the Dutch, and especially Peter Stuyvesant, who, who plays a, a large role in the beginning of the story, they ignore the instructions. And so, you know, Stuyvesant is told, let the, let the Lutherans alone. But does Stuyvesant do that? No. Um, and the, the Lutherans are allowed to send a minister to New Amsterdam. They, they say, great, now we get to have services. And Stuyvesant says, no, no, no. Just because you were allowed to send a minister here doesn't mean you can have services. And in fact, he eventually, he kicks the minister out of New Amsterdam. Um, and, and so Stuyvesant, same with the Jews who first settle in uh, New Amsterdam. Uh, uh, he does everything in his power to make life so miserable for them that they will leave. Um, and and it's, it's not so well known that, in fact, they do leave. And, and so New York doesn't have this, this long line of Jewish uh, residents starting with the Dutch, who kind of the Dutch Jew, the Jews who come from Curacao. Um, the Dutch are there, the, 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 the Jews are there, the Dutch make life for them miserable. They leave and only Jews only end up returning only end up returning later. Um, the other interesting thing I learned about the Dutch um, was that the Dutch were already, and keep in mind this is, this is the Dutch run New York before 1664 for about 40 years. Um, already in this period, the Dutch invent what becomes one of the, the most famous ways to make money in New York, which is real estate speculation. And, and that's, I, I don't mean that just by, you know, buy cheap, you know, buy low and sell high. What the Dutch, of course, discover is that location is everything. And by far the most popular place in New York, New Amsterdam in those days, is right down here at the very bottom of Manhattan Island. Everybody wants to be down there. That's the whole town, as you saw, is, is just down here, even just on the east side of down here. And so rather than settle, you know, over here or over here. What the Dutch do is they build more land onto the island. This is already happening in the middle 1600s, believe it or not. And so what I have here on this map is the dotted line is the original, the original outline of Manhattan Island. And then the solid line is the outline of Manhattan Island today. And already by the middle 1600s, the Dutch had added extra land over here to make Manhattan bigger because there's lots of real estate you can have further uptown, but everybody wants the prime real estate right by where all the most expensive real estate is. So the Dutch are already expanding Manhattan Island just decades after they arrived there in the middle of the 1600s. And of course, the Dutch were very skilled at turning water into land, so they had the skills to do that, and it didn't seem like such an extraordinary thing for them to do. Uh, that would, however, have grave implications for the city later on. The English would continue doing that and others afterward. And then when, when Hurricane Sandy hit a few years ago, you really see the impact of adding all that land. So what, what I did was I mapped the, the gray is the area flooded, the parts of Manhattan that flooded as a result of Sandy. And you can see that virtually every place there's flooding it's either one of two things. It's either land that wasn't originally part of Manhattan Island, or it was area that were wetlands. So here and here and here. These were wetlands originally in Manhattan that got covered over. And all those places got flooded in Sandy. So that really, I think, tells you something about both how immigrants early on wanted to expand Manhattan Island, were speculators, entrepreneurs very early on, and the implications that has, that has for New Yorkers today. So the Dutch take up the first part of the story. And then, of course, the English take over, take over New York, uh, take over New Amsterdam and, and turn it into New York. Um, I hadn't known when I started working on this that the English take over and then the Dutch take it back again. So those, those people who, are, who know about European history know about those wars. Uh, I hadn't known about that, that little interregnum where the, the Dutch took New York back and they went and they kind of went back to the English said, ha, 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 look at you guys, we took over now. And then the English took it back and, and then those Dutch people uh, were in bad shape because they got, 
Uh, the English weren't too nice to them for having uh, made fun of them. Um, so a lot of those Dutch end up, end up leaving because they've, they've worn out their welcome. Uh, another thing I hadn't known about New York was, uh, you know, New Yorkers, and I lived in New York for, for uh, up until 1990, New Yorkers think of themselves like that Steinberg cartoon as the epicenter of the world. And so it was a real surprise to me f to learn from the people who do uh, British colonial history in the, in the 18th century um, that the English didn't look at New York as the center of something. They really looked at it kind of as uh, a trading hub in particular for their Caribbean uh, possessions. And so, so much of New York's commerce was not with Europe or even with the other colonies in what becomes the United States, but with the Caribbean. Um, and, you know, a great example of that is, is Alexander Hamilton. Uh, Hamilton, who grows up in St. Croix um, and is, a, you know, becomes an orphan or he's a kind of a quasi-orphan. His, his mother dies, his father abandons him. And Hamilton is one of those people. He works as a, as a teenager for a trading company that, that does business with New York. And so, you know, a huge source of immigrants for, uh, for New York was not just Europe, but was the Caribbean. And these were people uh, who were of European origin who lived in the Caribbean. Um, you know, in the case of Hamilton, was the child of Carib people who had settled from Scotland in the Caribbean. Uh, others sometimes had been in the Caribbean for several generations. But they did so much business with New York that they ended up, they would go there perhaps to buy lumber, to buy other supplies, and they'd decide to settle there. Instead, they saw how a dynamic the trade was there, and they said, aha, I can do more trade, better trade there than I can in sleepy Christianstead or, or wherever the case might be. And that was the case with Hamilton. Hamilton, a super ambitious person, um, you know, even as, as a teenager, uh, he becomes famous when he writes this, uh, this letter that gets published in, in the newspapers uh, describing this great hurricane uh, in the Caribbean in the, uh, around 1770, and it gets published in the newspapers, and people are like, who is, this, who is this teenager who wrote this fabulous description? And when they learn it's this, it's this uh, orphan who has not had a day of formal schooling, they say, oh, what talent. We ought to, we ought to send him to, uh, to uh, North America and let him go to college. And Hamilton takes advantage of this. He tries to go. This is the other part of the story I, I didn't know so well because having gone to Columbia, they take pride. Hamilton went to Columbia. Uh, what I didn't know was Hamilton actually wanted to go to Princeton. And he, so he goes first to New Jersey. He goes first to New Jersey, and he goes to the head of Princeton, and he says, he says I want to come to your school, but four years, that's too much. I want to graduate in three years. I can't wait to get ahead. And the head of Princeton says, sorry, you have to take four years. That's the rule. So then he goes to New York and he goes to King's College and he says, he says, I'll come here and not go to Princeton if you'll let me finish in three years. And the King's College, they say, sure. And so that's how he ends up uh, at what becomes Columbia. Um, so Hamilton becomes one of these immigrants who becomes very involved in the American Revolution. Um, Scots in particular seem to be uh, play a leading role in the revolution in New York. The other famous example is Alexander McDougall, who kind of becomes a, a, a father figure for Hamilton before he meets George Washington, who becomes a, a, another father figure for, uh, for Hamilton. Now, at this point, you know, up to this point, New York does not have a very large population, by American standards perhaps, but you know, during the revolution, it has maybe 25,000 people. New York only starts to become a really large city as a result of Irish immigration. Um, and the Irish immigration, which really picks up after the war, you know, it had started before the revolution, but really picks up after the War of 1812 is over. Um, and that creates the first immigrant neighborhoods in the city. So this, this is a, a painting that's attributed to George Catlin of Five Points. Five Points is one of the first neighborhoods in New York that is associated with immigrants. It, it becomes associated with, with immigrants because it was built over one of those wet areas of Manhattan and therefore uh, as, as part of a real estate development scheme. But because it was so damp, um, 
the housing became very decrepit very quickly. It started to lean. The basements were very wet, the cellars. And as a result, people didn't, who had money didn't want to live there because they were afraid they'd get sick in those days, not knowing about bacteria and viruses. They associated illness with vapors. And Five Points was a very vaporous neighborhood having been built over a lake. So the only people who were willing to live there were the poorest people in New York who by 1827, about the time that this painting is, is, uh, is done, um, the Irish immigrants are the poorest New Yorkers. And they settle in huge numbers here. And this painting kind of encapsulates the view of the Irish already uh, in uh, the Jacksonian period. So if, if you look carefully here, you've got uh, a lady of the evening up here trying to uh, boast of her of uh, what she's selling. Um, you've, got, you've got here uh, pigs running amok in the mud. You've got and more pigs. You have lots of mixing of the races, whites and blacks there, intermingling in a way that was considered uh, very scandalous in that period. You've got drunkenness. If you look closely, you can see the, uh, the people staggering around drunk. You've already got, by this point, even the people in top hats who are coming as tourists to, to see the decrepitness of Five Points. Already, by this point, this was a place, if you're a tourist in New York, one of the sights to see is the wretchedness of Five Points. So a lot of the, the animus, the prejudice against immigrants is already apparent here in the 1820s. And of course, as, as the Irish continue to come to America, and especially to fill New York, um, that anti-Irish animus becomes even more pronounced. One of the things I didn't know when I was writing about Five Points, uh, which was this predominantly Irish neighborhood, was how Irish all of New York becomes, uh, especially after the potato famine that starts in the mid-1840s, uh, increases the immigration even further. Uh, so one of the things I found was that by, by the late 1850s, uh, Five Points was the most Irish part of New York, but three-quarters of New York wards uh, had more Irish immigrants in them than they had uh, adults, than they had native-born citizens. So, so the city itself becomes kind of an Irish metropolis. Um, one of the nice things about doing research on New York recently was I was able to find things that I couldn't find when I was working on Five Points. Although I have to, I, I have to give credit. Uh, one of my favorite things I talk about in the book actually was found by a, a Washington, D.C. high school student. Uh, this is, was a, an article that, that came out uh, recently where this student debunked this, this article. Article that had come out a couple of decades ago saying that there really wasn't the very much anti-Irish sentiment, and in particular that, that the idea that there were no Irish need apply signs was a myth. And the idea that there were signs in windows that said no Irish need apply, I think that probably is fairly a myth because it would be pretty stupid to put that sign in your window because you'd come back to your business the next day and your window would be broken. <laughs> but what this, what this high school student at Sidwell Friends found using the electronic search capabilities of, of uh, modern newspaper databases was that no Irish need apply advertisements for domestic servants and so forth actually were quite numerous. I mean, she found literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, and, and this helped kind of put to rest this idea that, uh, that Irish Americans had made up this, this, this idea of, of uh, discrimination as, as, uh, as a badge of honor that, that wasn't really true. And that was something I, I was happy to be able to put into the, uh, into the story. Another thing I talk about in the book is how Irish immigrants, uh, despite starting out so impoverished, actually tend to do fairly well in New York. Uh, we, we tend to think that immigrants themselves are, are never going to achieve that much, that it's their children, typically, who move up the, the socioeconomic ladder. Uh, but one thing I found, and this is an image of, of immigrants at the Emigrant Savings Bank in New York, which was a bank set up specifically by Irish uh, Americans for Irish immigrants in New York. Um, that the Irish had surprisingly large amounts of money in their savings accounts. Now, I'm not talking about that they were rich by American standards by any means, but, uh, but that people who lived in these decrepit tenements in Five Points, and we know how decrepit they were, nonetheless had, you know, in those days, hundreds of dollars, which in today's terms would be thousands of dollars, and yet continued to live in Five Points. And I think that tells us something uh, 
you know, that we might know about immigrants today if we read a lot about them, that, that you know, immigrants are going to tend to save their money, and that might be to start a business, to send money back to their homeland, to, to relatives, and so that even though they might look poorly dressed, they might work at the lowest, the jobs at the lowest end of the uh, economic, economic totem pole, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not making money, but they're going to spend that money on things they want, which might mean saving money to buy a business, saving money to buy a house, or saving money to start a business back home, or, or to, to, to pay for the, the upkeep of loved ones who are living back in their homeland. And I think one of the most interesting things I found uh, that I talk about in the story, this is an image from the New York City draft riots of 1863, where, where Irish immigrants go on a, uh, on a uh, you know, it, it's hard to call it anything, but kind of almost a pogrom of, of violence and, and killing of, of uh, aimed, the violence aimed at Republicans and the killing aimed at African Americans. And, and so typically the way this story is told is that the Irish immigrants are, um, you know, they don't want African Americans to be emancipated. They don't want, um, they, they don't want that economic competition of, of slaves who might become free and come take their jobs. But what I found was the story was, was much more complicated. Sure, there are, there are people who are doing things like this. And I just actually, the other day, I was in New York and I walked up up Hudson Street, so this is if this is uh, Hudson Street right here, and so you can see there's a ship there at the, on the Hudson River, and that street, that Clarkson Street, is still a tree-lined street. I was amazed that the trees are are still there, um, but I found the story to be much more complicated. One of the, um, if we just go back to here, one of the most kind of famous story uh, stories that's typically told about Irish prejudice. Uh, and African Americans, it's quoted in, in dozens of books, is this uh, story of this guy named Felix Brannigan, who um, is an Irish immigrant who serves in the uh, Union Army in Virginia, and he writes to his sister back in New York about the prospect of African Americans being allowed in the Army. And he, he says he's vehemently opposed to this, and he says, we won't fight side and side with thee, and he uses the N-word, he says, we're too proud a race for that. And this quote is in dozens of history books exemplifying the attitude that led to the draft riots and, and, and the scenes like I showed you. But what I found really amazing was I looked more into Brannigan's story. Um, and, and what I found was, was really interesting. And I was able to do this with things like Ancestry.com. I was just curious, where does this guy end up? And so I found, find him in 1870. He's in Washington. And he's actually attending GW, where I teach, and Eric teach, GW Law School, though then it's called Columbian College. And then I find him later in Mississippi. And it turns out what has happened to him is after the war, uh, he works in Washington, like lots of veterans do, as a clerk. Um, he goes to, to law school. He becomes a lawyer. And he gets a job as, a US, as an assistant U.S. attorney in Mississippi, in the Southern District of Mississippi. He eventually becomes the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Mississippi. And, and there, his, his main job is to prosecute Klansmen uh, and, and other people who are terrorizing African Americans. And he couldn't have gotten that job as a U.S. Attorney if he hadn't become a Republican. And in fact, he had become a Republican. And then I kind of went backwards once I found that out, and I looked at his military record and found that Brannigan actually, having written those words in 1862, Nonetheless, by 1864, once blacks are allowed in the Union Army, he volunteered, when a lot of whites wouldn't, he volunteered to be a commander of an African-American unit and was a commander of an African-American unit for several years. So he seems to be someone who, as far as one can tell, perhaps, uh, like a lot of people, like Abraham Lincoln, grew as, uh, as the war went on and, and came to perhaps have a different view uh, of African-Americans. Now, at the same time Irish immigrants are coming to New York, Germans are coming too. Um, the, story, the story I focus, one of the stories I focus on in my German chapter is this of the Steinways, Henry the father and William the son here. Um, <clears throat> they exemplify the hard work that so many immigrants put themselves through. Um, the Ste Henry Steinway was a famous piano maker back in the German states. He had won awards for his pianos. He had sold them to... German royalty. And yet he believed that his, his 
you know, his upward mobility there was limited. He'd always be seen as a craftsman. The number of people he could sell pianos to was very limited. He looked to America, where it seemed like everybody had, the, you know, had enough money to buy a piano, as a place he could do better. So he comes to New York. He brings his, his sons and daughters with him. Um, and he starts working. Even though he has lots of, you know, comparatively lots of money, he takes a job as a, a kind of the lowest job in a New York piano works. Doesn't tell the people there that he has experience, you know, that he's actually made whole pianos and, and won these awards. Uh, and he takes that job, you know, it pays virtually nothing, in order to kind of learn the ropes of the New York piano market. You know, who buys, what is the price, what are workers paid, what kind of conditions do workers accept. Um, and he and his sons, and he sends his son to work at a different piano works. And each son has to go work at a different piano works so they can, you know, collect intelligence on the market. And then after several years of doing this and living mostly off their savings because they're, they're earning a, a pittance at, uh, with the jobs they take, they open Steinway and Sons. They're, they changed their name from Steinweg to Steinway to make it sound more American. And very quickly, they become successful. So that a couple years after opening, they're able to open a bigger piano uh, factory up on what's now Park Avenue. And then a decade after that, they open a huge factory village in Queens. Now, the Germans in New York tended to live on uh, what becomes known as the Lower East Side, but had been known previously as Klein Deutschland, or Little Germany. The Eastern European Jews who start coming to New York in great numbers in the 1880s uh, settle in that same neighborhood, Klein Deutschland. In part, I think, because they, there were significant numbers of German Jews who lived in Klein Deutschland. I think also perhaps in part because uh, they thought that speaking Yiddish, they could communicate to some extent with the German-speaking uh, people who lived in, in uh, Klein Deutschland. And also because the Germans had come to dominate the, the clothing business in New York already by the Civil War period, certainly by the end of the Civil War period, um, with examples like, you know, Levi Strauss is a great example. He, he's one of those many immigrants who comes to New York, lives there a few years, takes what he's learned. In this case, he goes to California and becomes a big success making blue jeans and, and other supplies for, for miners, yet keeping his, the part of his family in New York where they, where they sew uh, and, and make the supplies that he'll then sell in California. Um, now, the big problem I had in writing my chapter on the Lower East Side was, what could I possibly say that was new about the Lower East Side? And I have to admit, you know, that if you're an expert like Alan, you know, Alan Kraut's not going to learn a ton of new things about the Lower East Side from my chapter. But I, I'm still proud that I found some some things that I thought were interesting. One was that I found uh, some interesting descriptions of the, what it sounded like to live on the Lower East Side. And this I found really interesting. Um, Nellie Bly, have you ever heard of Nellie Bly, the famous investigative reporter of the late 19th century? So one day William Randolph Hearst, uh, no, not Hearst, the Pulitzer, uh, Joseph Pulitzer, himself an immigrant, who I talk about in the book, um, sends Nellie Bly to go live in New York's most crowded tenement for a weekend and then write a story about what it's like. And I'd never seen this described in anything about the Lower East Side, so I look at this. And one of the most interesting things she talks about is the noise. And, and I'd never thought of that. I mean, you can imagine, you see descriptions of the Lower East Side and you hear the talk about, you know, peddlers hawking their wares, and I, I, I could imagine what that sounded like. But Nellie Bly said, no, there's something else. She says, the, the time you really hear the noise is at night. She says, the Lower East Side is so crowded um, and I think the best way to, to imagine what she's describing is you think about when you're in a theater. So a crowded theater, not a movie theater, but a, like a Broadway theater, with a couple of thousand people. Right before the show is about to start, everybody's talking, right? And you hear that buzz of all the thousand, couple of thousand people talking, and they're each talking pretty loud to be heard over the buzz. And that's what she describes the Lower East Side as like 24 hours a day. She says, you're trying to sleep at night, but you can't because there's this buzz, this constant buzz because there are so many people and your tenement is so crowded and the streets are so crowded with people trying to escape the crowding of the tenements. And, and so, so the sound of what it was like to live on the Lower East Side is something I describe in the book. And, and that might be something that even most people who are expert on that wouldn't have quite thought about before. 
Another thing I found that was interesting is when we tend to talk about the Lower East Side, we talk about dumbbell tenements like this, and then the dumbbell tenement is part of the, the, the famous story of uh, inept attempts at tenement reform. It's an attempt to make a better tenement, but it's really worse. The air shafts they have spread noise and, and, and so forth, and they don't really provide ventilation. But one of the things I found was I went and looked at these maps that would show what each building looked like, and what I found was that the Lower East Side actually never had a majority dumbbell tenements, that, that, uh, that still most of the tenements, even in a place like the Lower East Side, never even got to that stage of reform and were pre-dumbbell pre tenements, what were known as pre-law tenements. And that was something interesting I, I, that I also found. Um, I also found that the Lower East Side wasn't as segregated. Um, we tend to think of kind of the Russian Jews living in one part and the Romanian Jews living in another part. And the Russian Jews did, did concentrate because they were the, the biggest number by far. But I, I found they were kind of like the Irish from Cork. There's so many people from Cork in New York that there are Cork people everywhere. And same with Russian Jews. There, you know, it, there was the part of the Lower East Side that was known as the Romanian part. But there are more Russian Jews there than there are Romanian Jews. Um, because there are just so many Russians. Um, at the same time that the Lower East Side fills with, it, uh, with East European Jews, um, New York also fills with Italians. Um, in my chapter on Italian immigrants, I focus in particular on the story of this man in the middle wearing the, wielding the pickaxe, uh, whose name, his given name was Pasquale D'Angelo. This is, again, I find this funny how immigrants think they are Americanizing their name. So he Americanizes his name by changing Pasquale to Pascal. Um, and he's an immigrant who writes this amazing autobiography uh, that I had never heard of before I, I started working on this, this book. Um, he, is, he comes to America in the 1890s. He's actually from that area where all those earthquakes are happening now in central Italy. Um, and he works in these labor gangs, building roads, and eventually he settles on, on railroad road work, and he lives in an abandoned boxcar to, to, to save money. But amazingly, despite living you know, in these horrible circumstances, he aspires to something better. So he, his goal is not just to, to have some money and maybe uh, uh, decent clothes. His goal is to be a poet, he decides. Mm -hmm. And so he quits his day labor job, and he moves to Brooklyn, because he thinks that's where artists live. He goes to Brooklyn and decides to be a poet. And he lives in even worse squalor in Brooklyn, because now he's not even making any money. And he writes his poetry, and he sends it to, to magazines. Um, and years of struggling, and he lives, first he lives on, on bananas, and then when he can't afford bananas anymore, he goes and buys the, ruined bananas that, the, that the, the vendors are going to throw away. And they say, we can't sell you this. This isn't fit for habitation. And he says, oh, it's for my monkey, you know, because there were so many organ grinders in New York who were Italian. And they say, all right, well, we'll give you the bananas because they're for your monkey. And that's what he, he lives on, that and, and, and stale bread. Um, and he eventually gets discovered miraculously um, through his hard work. And he becomes famous for a little while. This photo is taken. His poems get, get published. Um, he writes this autobiography, he kind of gets his 15 minutes of fame, he makes the press all over the United States. But the story ends up being a sad one. Um, uh, he insists, even though all these people uh, offered to, to, to pay for him to live in better conditions, he says, no, I only want to earn money by my poetry. Uh, but the Great Depression starts, nobody wants to buy poetry anymore. Uh, and so by the, middle, by the middle of the Great Depression, he dies in his 30s uh, he, of, of uh, appendicitis because he's, he, he doesn't seek medical treatment. He's too poor. Uh, and so this, you know, even though I, I talk about lots of people who make it, strike it rich, like the Steinways, uh, I try to show that there are stories like this as well. Now, one of the interesting things about New York is how in a neighborhood that's known for one ethnic group at one time becomes known as another, for another ethnic group soon thereafter. Five Points was that way. It went from being Irish to Italian to, to Chinese. Um, there were many little Italys in New York. One of them was in, uh, in Harlem. This is an image of the Harlem Little Italy. Um, I had no idea there were natural gas tanks uh, or gas tanks uh, in Manhattan, but there were, I discovered. And they put them in immigrant neighborhoods like 
uh, like this Little Italy. But this, this image, which you can see the photographer labeled Little Italy in the early 20th century, soon becomes El Barrio after um, Congress severely limits immigration in the 1920s, especially from Eastern Europe and, and Southern Europe. Um, the gap in the labor market is filled in part by Puerto Ricans. Because Puerto Rico has become part of the United States, people from there can come to, to the United States without having to worry about the immigration restrictions. So with the relative shortage of, of uh, low-wage workers who are in New York, Puerto Ricans moved by the tens of thousands to New York in the 1920s and 30s and 40s and 50s. Um, and they take neighborhoods like this and turn them from Italian neighborhoods into uh, Latino neighborhoods. Um, Italians, just, just like the Irish tried to keep Italians out of their neighborhoods like five points, Italians tried to keep the Puerto Ricans out of what they considered their neighborhoods generation later. Uh, and that's what you see here. I, I, I talk in the book, I, I, there's some great uh, Latino memoirs that, that I uh, quote in the book. Uh, Piri Thomas is, is one of my, my favorites, and he describes how when he's a kid, how his mother sends him to buy groceries across the dividing line in the Italian part of the neighborhood where uh, Puerto Ricans weren't supposed to go. And he he's, doesn't want to tell his mother, you know, I'm going to get beat up if I go there. And so he, he goes there. And he's determined to stand up to the Italian bully of the neighborhood. And so he fights back, and he gets so badly beaten up, he ends up in the hospital for a couple of days. Yet he's very proud because his father comes to him in the hospital and says, in the Spanish to him, he says, now you're a man. Now you're un hombre. Um, and so Thomas is very proud of this and talks about this in his, in his memoir. Um, one of the other interesting things I learned about the effect that Puerto Ricans had on New York immigrants was the fact that Puerto Ricans become a godsend to the hundreds of thousands of illegal immigrants who come to the United States after immigration restriction is put into effect. We, we tend to think of, of illegal immigration as a modern phenomenon, but it is not. Just as soon as immigration restriction is put in place on the Chinese in the 1880s, they start immigrating uh, illegally. Um, in the 1920s, when the further restrictions are put in place, illegal immigration becomes very widespread among those groups who are being most targeted. So that's, uh, in this case, particularly Italians and Eastern European Jews, uh, but other groups as well. And so you find all sorts of New Yorkers, when they are caught by the authorities and, and accused of being illegal immigrants, they say, no, no, no. I'm Puerto Rican, and there's a big market in New York for fake Puerto Rican birth certificates. So if you're an illegal immigrant in New York, one of the things you do if you're, you know, if you're dark-skinned or if you're not dark-skinned, because Puerto Rico has dark-skinned people, has not dark-skinned people, um, is you go to Harlem or El Barrio and you buy a fake Puerto Rican birth certificate so that if you're caught, you can show that and say, and I, and I found even Bengali illegal immigrants were, were wielding Puerto Rican fake Puerto Rican birth certificates to try to, to uh, evade the law. So just as soon as um, Puerto Ricans feel like they are the dominant uh, Latino group in New York, uh, they become challenged by a, a new wave of Latino immigrants from the Dominican Republic. Um, and Dominicans come to New York for similar reasons that Puerto Ricans did. You know, had the United States not intervened in Puerto Rico, uh, probably Puerto Ricans would have gone someplace else. But the United States, which had invaded and uh, occupied the Dominican Republic several times in the 20th century, had given Dominicans a taste of what America had. And so uh, starting in the 1960s, Dominicans begin coming to the United States uh, in large numbers. Um, they follow the Jews who are leaving the garment industry and, and start filling those jobs. Washington Heights, pictured here, becomes their Lower East Side. Um, one of the things that, that I had to decide about in, in writing about Dominican uh, New York was whether or not to talk about um, the drug trade. So when I lived in New York in the 1980s, one of the things you associated Dominicans with was crack dealers and Washington Heights with the drug trade. And that was where people went to buy drugs. Um, and what I decided was that I wouldn't focus on that. And the book has, has only a tiny, tiny little bit about um, 
Italian organized crime, and there only because I focus on this one New York City policeman whose job it was to try to stamp it out. Um, what I decided was that, you know, ev that every group of New Yorkers has criminals within it. And even though the media and TV writers in particular are obsessed with immigrant crime, so I get calls all the time from TV people who want me to tell them about the Irish gangs and the Italian gangs. I just tell them, you know, I don't, I don't think those were any more a part of the city than native born than Protestant gangs or, or, or anything else. Um, so I decided I wasn't gonna talk about organized crime and immigrants, not about uh, the mafia, not about Irish gangs, not about Dominican drug dealers, uh, because I really think that's not a major part of the story. So instead, one of my focuses on the Dominican section of the book is Oscar de la Renta, uh, who's probably the most famous Dominican immigrant in New York. Um, he becomes, uh, you know, it, it's not, I think, a coincidence. Dominicans go into the garment trade. Oscar de la Renta who's, is not ever poor enough that he has to work in the garment trade, but becomes famous uh, as a designer um, and becomes a, a, a famous New Yorker. And as I said, I think probably until the advent of some of today's baseball players, uh, probably the most famous Dominican American. Um, West Indians are a huge part of modern New York's immigrant population. Um, they come for the same reasons that the immigrants have been coming to New York for, for generations. Um, very diverse group, um, Jamaicans, Haitians, Barbadians, Guyanese. The Guyanese to me are the most interesting part of the story. I, even most New Yorkers I think today don't realize that and, and I realize it may be Guyanese. Uh, I've, every, everybody tells me I pronounce it wrong, but everybody tells me a different way that they pronounce it. Um, in any case, uh, Guyana, which is the northern coast of South America, um, they're the, the sixth largest immigrant group in New York. And, but nobody knows that. And immigrant groups that are much smaller, like from India, um, from Korea, um, get much more press in terms of the immigrant population. That made it really hard for me because writing about modern immigration, I had to rely either on social scientists or the press. And social scientists have not written at all about these immigrants, um, Guyanese immigrants in particular, but West Indians almost in general. Um, they write a lot more about Chinese immigrants, about Korean immigrants, uh, about Dominican immigrants. Uh, and that made my, my job much more difficult. Um, one of the things I talk about in the book is the Crown Heights riot. This is an image from the Crown Heights riot of the early 1990s, which to me is kind of the New York City draft riots of the 20th century. This is a riot uh, in which uh, West Indian New Yorkers rioted to protest. Uh, a, a, a child of West Indian immigrants was struck and killed by a car being driven uh, kind of in a motorcade of, of Orthodox Jews through Crown Heights. Crown Heights had, had a large West Indian population, but also a large Orthodox Jewish population. Um, when the driver of the car is not arrested, um, there's uh, this riot, and this image shows Mayor Dinkins in the, in the middle trying to, to mediate, uh, but you have this one Jewish resident of Crown Heights with a lot of West, Indri West Indians there in the image who are, who are angry. Um, and, and so in trying to tell the West Indian story, I, I talk about... Um, and I had to rely, again, because the sources otherwise aren't there, on, on news accounts. And so the news accounts tend to focus on, on two things, on kind of dramatic events like riots, um, on boycotts. There's a famous West Indian boycott of a Korean grocery. Um, and then also of kind of success stories. And so there are a lot of press, a lot of newspaper stories about successful immigrants who then you know, become successful business people of one kind or another, and I, and I talk about those too. Then the last group I talk about in the book are Chinese immigrants. And in a sense, it, it chronologically didn't make sense to, to have them last because there's a Chinatown in New York already by the 1880s, but it's tiny. And today, the Chinese are a huge population in New York. They're, they're about to surpass Dominicans as the number one immigrant group in New York. And I think that's kind of 
appropriate because today, I and mean, this is something very few Americans know, but today there are more Asians immigrating to the United States than Latinos, something you, know, you wouldn't know by looking at the press or very often, but, or, or certainly the, the talk in the, in the election. Um, so one of the things I talk about is how uh, Chinese immigrants today, when they first start out in New York, live very much like immigrants lived in places like Lower East Side or Five Points 100 years ago. Uh, Jacob Reese has famous pictures of immigrants crammed into tenements on bunks. This is a, a picture taken around 1990 uh, that appeared in, on the front page of the New York Times. Um, and this is, believe it or not, this is a, a 12 by 12 room that is crammed full of triple-decker bunks. This is the only floor space in the room, right here. And as you can see, the bunks are full, the floor is filled, and what you very may well have is that even those bunks don't belong to one person, that one person who works the day shift at the Chinese restaurant um, lets somebody else who works the night shift in some other job sleep in the bunk at night. And, and in that way, these immigrants scrimp and save and uh, either send money to relatives or, or pay off the people who got them illegally into the United States. Few people remember uh, today that in the 1990s, when you thought of illegal immigration, you actually thought of the Chinese. And the famous example of this was this ship, the Golden Venture, on the right here, which was this trawler that was turned into a, 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 an immigrant vessel. And several hundred illegal immigrants were, were, the attempt was to smuggle them into the United States and getting desperate and, and not having the, the little fishing boats that were supposed to meet them to offload the passengers uh, and running out of food. They just ran the ship aground off the Rockaways, which is part of Queens uh, in New York. And the immigrants jumped overboard because they were told if you set foot on land, you'll be given asylum because, because of the political situation. The Chinese had this very favorable uh, asylum situation, kind of like Cubans also. And so here's an image from the, from the Daily News of one of those uh, immigrants trying to get ashore. What year is that? This is, the, this is 1993, when the Golden Venture uh, lands. Um, as I said, the, the Chinese will soon be New York's largest immigrant group. Um, and, you know, you, on the East Coast, you don't see this so much, but you go to the West Coast, and, and you can't help but seeing how large the Asian immigrant population is, not just in places like Los Angeles and San Francisco, but in, in, San, in uh, Seattle and in all up and down the West Coast, and even, even more so in some ways in, in British Columbia. So that the Chinese went to such lengths to move to New York and that so many people from around the world still aspire to move there, I think shows that despite all the ways in which the world has changed over the past 400 years, uh, New York still remains almost uniquely the world's city of dreams. Thank you. So now we move to our question discussion period. We've got a couple of ground rules. Uh, if you would raise your hand and wait for the microphone uh, before you speak, uh, use the microphone when you get it, uh, and identify yourself uh, before you ask your question. Uh, that's the ground rules. So we have a hand up right in the back. Let's get the microphone there. Thank you. Hi, Mary Carrick. Um, in your book, do you cover the 1965, uh, the Heart Cellar Immigration Act of 1965 when we opened up our immigration to the third world and how it changed um, the uh, demographics of New York? <laughs> yes, of course I do. I have, to, I have to talk about that in great detail because... You know, I mean, that changes everything in terms of, of modern American immigration. So uh, I talk about the law, and in particular, I talk about um, the politics behind its passage and, um, and the unintended consequences it has, that, that the people, you know, the, there's the, the uh, I have the quote in there from Edward Kennedy. Um, both Edward Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson say, this law is really going to change nothing. America will not change because of this law. It's just going to make things more fair. America is going to be exactly the same. And, and of course, that turns out not to be true, mostly because uh, that um, people don't realize how many uh, relatives of immigrants who come to the United States from these new places that hadn't been let in before will join them, and they uh, will, are going to be able to come in above and beyond the quotas because the law allows for 
uh, family members to immigrate un, uh, above and beyond the quota. So if you can get one family member into the country, you then it's very easy to get many more in above and beyond the quota. And that's why uh, legal immigration becomes much, much larger than the people who had written the law intended it. Uh, yes, yeah, right here, Jim, in the middle. The microphone's coming right here. Orange jacket. Thank you. Uh, James Banner. Tyler, um, uh, you know, we historians are accused of being lumpers uh, or splitters. Um, let me be a lumper at the moment and press you at least in that direction. Um, where is the structure of this story? Does it adhere in the immigrants or in the nation to which they come? That's, in other words, you, 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 you stress the similarities, but the historian in me, in me is somewhat suspicious of that. I'm also interested in the differences. Um, and certainly there had to be some changes between Castle William and today, the Dutch and us, um, even in New York City. And then I'm moved to ask you also, and this may be unfair, and if so, just tell me and we'll, we won't pursue this line of, I won't press you at all, do it. Is the New York experience of these waves of immigrants adding to each other, supplanting each other, gaining on each other, and so on, is that replicated, do you think, I mean, is this a national story? Is it replicated in Omaha, in Minneapolis, in Pensacola? All right, so those are two very big questions. They are. Um, so let's start with the first one first. So here's what, what I'd say about the, <clears throat> why I think the story is so similar and not so different. And so, so are there differences? Well, of course. There are differences, but if you, if you had to, like I did in a sense, had to write the story of several dozen immigrant groups and you wrote them consecutively, you, you'd see that the similarities, not only do they far outnumber the, the differences, they almost overwhelm the differences and make them hard to see. So you think, what, what is the immigrant experience? It is. It is a wrenching departure from a beloved homeland. Sometimes voluntarily, sometimes not. But no matter what, leaving is heartbreaking. The voyage is, for the most part, um, life-defining. Just that interregnum, when you are homeless, when you are on, when you don't know what lies ahead of you. You've heard it's great. You've heard it's good, but you don't know whether to trust those people. And you're scared. And you're terrified. And that's the case whether you're on a ship for two months, on a ship for a week, or in an airport for tw and an airplane combined for, say, 24 hours. It's terrifying nonetheless. When you arrive, it's disorienting. Everything seems strange. Every, it seems impossible that you'll ever fit in. Um, more often than not, you can't work at the job you worked at before. Or if you can, it's totally different than it was where you had it before. The expectations are different. The rules are different. The tools are different. Um, and then the adjustment that, that immigrants tend not to, you know, my feeling is immigrants don't assimilate nearly as much as people think. And people say, why don't today's immigrants assimilate as much as the ones in the past? And my answer is because the ones in the past didn't assimilate so much. Uh, we, we mythologize that. And so, so that's the same too. And, and so what I see is, I see all these similarities over and over and over. And, and so the differences to me are relatively superficial. So that is your first question. Now, the second question, let me just answer briefly, was what again? Yeah, is this a New York story? Oh, right, right, right. I just my interest in whether this has to do with the immigrants or it has to do with the structure of the United States, its laws, and so on. Where, where is the story in the people or in what they come to? Right. So I think part of it is, I think this is a story that's replicated around the country with different specifics. So what's unique about New York, I think, is some things like the garment industry. 
some things like its sheer size, some things like the variety of immigrant groups. So of course there are lots of immigrant groups who don't come to New York, you know. There are hardly any Vietnamese in New York. There are hardly any, you know, Serbians in New York. And so, so you know, they're in Chicago, let's say. So, so I think overall um, it's a story that is replicated but with different specifics. Could I, um, so many hands, but I'm going to steal a question here as, you know, chair's prerogative and kind of follow up on, on Jim's question and, and ask, why New York? So, you know, city of dreams, uh, but in the late 19th century, Chicago is a major destination. People go to Detroit. Go to the 20th century, you don't go to Detroit anymore. Uh, there are new immigrants in Chicago, but still, New York still attracts. Um, uh, today, as it did in 1900, as it did in you know, 1880, in a way that other cities don't necessarily attract anymore. So what is it about New York? And, and, and specifically, this, where the economy fits in, particularly in the 20th century. Uh, but your, your, your emphasis is on the immigrant experience and you do attend to the economy somewhat, but I'm wondering if you could elaborate, like what makes New York the continual magnet that it is when other cities may or may not attract immigrants in any large number, especially as we move through the 20th century? Well, now obviously that's a very complicated, the, the answer to that question is very complicated, um, but I can give a relatively simple short answer that isn't maybe going to be satisfactory, but it starts at an answer. So I think in part the answer has to do with um, geography. So New York ends up being lucky that it's so constricted with that island shape, so it doesn't develop heavy manufacturing the way Detroit or Chicago does, and, and that helps New York in the sense that it diversifies its economy in a way that the economy of some of those other places isn't diversified. Um, so, so that's part of it. Um, there's, there's also the part of New York becoming, I mean, I, you could write a whole book about this, this your question there. I, I mean, I, it's, it's hard to know where to, where to start. Um, in, in part, it has to do, I think, with um, There are, there are, the finance part of it, I think, is huge. So New York has, has capital that's, that, that, is, that is constantly uh, being invested. It, it's, you know, it's, it's a hard question to answer. I, I, it's, I feel like I can't do it justice in, in, in two minutes. But, it has and, Island. What's that? It has Ellis Island. It has Ellis Island, yeah. I mean, it's clearly one of the things it has is that it's simply the place people get off the boat. And if they don't want to go any farther, that is one of the places they go. And, yeah, and that predates, that predates Ellis Island. Um, Good. All right, we have so many other hands. Let's do this side for a second, uh, right up here, and then we'll get back to this side. Thank you for the talk. It was very rich. You are? Uh, Alan Kraut, Thank American you. University. I'm wondering uh, whether or not in the way we're framing these questions, we aren't sort of loading the dice. We're sort of asking you whether or not uh, it isn't true that Oscar Handlin was right, that everybody went in one direction, uh, ripped themselves from their home, went someplace else, worked hard and succeeded. Uh, isn't the situation a little bit more complicated? In the case of the Italians, for example, they were a labor migration. A lot of their patterns follow, are much more similar to the Mexicans. They went back and forth on a seasonal pattern for years until immigration restriction. Uh, their expectations were that they were going to go home someday. Most of them never wanted to stay until they got caught in the, in the trap of, of the legislation of the 1920s. So, um, uh, and moreover, the economy was changing. And to come back to, to Jim's point, uh, the nature of the industrial economy in New York was in, trans, uh, in transition. And so different groups with different sets of skills ended up coming at different times. And often it was not their first destination. Uh, in the case of my grandfather, who was a garment worker, they spent time in London. Others spent time in Paris, uh, working the garment trades and following the higher wages. Uh, people went back. <laughs> 
and came back again. So it's a, I'm, I'm wondering if you'd dwell a little bit on the complexity of the patterns themselves and the interrelationship of those patterns to, to the economic patterns that Jim was referring to. Sure. I mean, uh, I, I talk about all those things in the book, but I didn't have time to, to talk about them in my talk. It, it's hard to, to cover so much in, in so little time. But, but yes, uh, the, what I can do in a, in a little summary here, it, it doesn't do justice to the complexity of the story. So I, I talk, for instance, about how so many of the, the Jewish immigrants who come to uh, America go to places like London in particular, but, but to other places parts of, of Europe, too. I, um, you know, I talk about Samuel Gompers. He's, he's an example of, of that, whose family stopped in, in London. Um, and, I, and I talk in great detail about how, the, how Italians do not come to the United States originally imagining that they're going to, to stay here. And people like Pascal D'Angelo, his expectation was, I'm going to come here a few years, save some money, pay off the family debts, and go back to Italy. Um, and there the situation, you know, it's, it's doubly similar to the Mexican situation in the sense that both groups have ended up, I think, staying in the United States more because being kind of trapped by immigration laws that had, you know, again, unintended consequences. People thought, oh, if we make these laws, they, they, they you know, we'll keep them out. But instead, we kept them in. And it's same thing with Italians. Italians were, you know, became afraid to leave for fear of not being able to get back in. Um, and the same thing happens with you know, that long centuries-old tradition of uh, Mexican migration into the United States, which, which ends after those restrictions are put in place um, in the 20th century. So, so there's the very beginning of saying, yes, it's very, very complicated, lots of nuance. And, and, and even though I talk about those things in the book, having to cover 400 years, I can't possibly cover them in as much detail or nuance as as I would like, and that's, that's, you know, believe me, every chapter I look at, I see those things that I know, because, you know, every chapter is based, you know, I, I read dozens of books, and so I know all that nuance, and yet I have to, and there's the narrative challenge, you know, is how do you, how do you keep the story going, and yet, so I try. Yeah. Right up here in the front, gentlemen. Thank you very much. I'm Benjamin to a New Yorker and retired diplomat. Uh, you uh, referred to the role of crime or the element of crime in each group. And of course, Daniel Bell has talked about crime as a rung on the ladder of upward social mobility. I wonder if you could uh, address that uh, a little bit as it refers to New York and also the uh, geographic uh, dimension of, ap of uh, uh, upward social mobility as people move up the socioeconomic ladder, they move further uptown and then eventually to Queens and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I'd be very reluctant to endorse Bell's characterization. Um, I think crime is everywhere, and you know we tend to focus on the sensational crime, and we tend to like to stereotype our criminals. So you know, I mean, you look at you look at the election today, and certain people are focused on you know the illegal immigrant who committed a murder, as if as if only illegal immigrants commit murder, or even that they commit disproportionate amounts of murder, which is certainly not the case. Uh, and you know, so I talk in the book about statistics that show that 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 uh, immigrants c commit less crime than natives and immigrant neighborhoods have less crime than non-immigrant neighborhoods. So, so yeah, I, I, I would not endorse Bell's point of view. And then the, what was the other part again? Well, uh, the microphone. Oh, the, 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 that's right, no, I remember, the, uh, the, the latter, yes. Right, so, and I wasn't suggesting that a majority of immigrants are criminals, but the, it is one way to kind of get a hold into the system through crime, and then your kids go to Harvard and Yale. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. I think that's that's the way a nativist looks at it and says as, and says, "Woe is me! Our, our we're now our country is now our city is now crime ridden because of the immigrants." But that's but. Not the way I'm looking at it. I'm not a right. No, no, no. I'm not saying you are, but I'm saying that that the the. You were talking about how people look at it, and I'm saying that the, the way people look at it is, 
I think that's, I, I think that's inaccurate. And then uh, you're right, and I talk in the book about how the, the immigrants, as they, as they do better, move out of Manhattan into Brooklyn, into Queens, into the Bronx, and I talk about Arthur Avenue and the places that, that Alan knows from the Bronx, where he's from, and I talk about the Brownsville in East New York, where the, the Ann Binders went after they could afford to leave the Lower East Side. And so yes, that's a very important part of the story. Um, right there. Stephen Shore, wonderful talk. I, I, I'm reminded of Arthur Miller's play, From the Bridge which ostensibly dealt with as a counterpoint to on the waterfront about whether one should testify before HUAC or not. But nonetheless, in On the Bridge, you have a father who doesn't, doesn't like the man whose daughter is dating and informs on his illegal immigrant status. And that is he becomes shunned by the community. And in terms of crime and nativism, I'm always reminded of the story when Eleanor Roosevelt tried to investigate where Franklin's fortune came from and found it came largely from the Delano's drug dealing with the, in the opium trade. Hmm. I didn't know about that part. Um, but in terms of the, gosh, now that I have that image in my mind, I'm having trouble remembering what your other part was. The, um, what, oh, yes. I, I love that play, which I see is going to be at the Kennedy Center next month. Um, yeah, that, that play, that was actually the first time I'd ever heard of illegal Italian immigration, and that was the thing that, that got me started on, on finding, and you know, since then, there's been good, good uh, scholarship on that, uh, especially about Jewish illegal immigration. We don't quite have a, a good work yet on Italian illegal immigration that we could use, but, but yeah, I love, that, that's, that play's a favorite of mine. Uh, right up here. Thank you. Carmel Chiswick from uh, George Washington University. I'm an economic historian, and I thoroughly enjoyed your talk and look forward to learning more about the book. Uh, when people talk about immigrants and immigrant New York, the stereotype or the image that we have are these new immigrants who are just off the boats or these hardworking immigrants that are trying very hard to uh, find a niche in the American economy, but you really don't think about the success stories. Now, you mentioned someone like Oscar de la Renta and the famous people, but there are a lot of sort of upper middle class, uh, we, don't, we call them hyphenated Americans, we don't even call them immigrants anymore. And the second generation, the children of immigrants, are part of the immigrant experience, even though they may have been born here. And I suggest, and I'm wondering if you deal with this in your book, that one of the reasons we think of New York as an immigrant city is because of all the ethnicities, the, the, that are the, the ethnic neighborhoods and the interactions between the children of immigrants and the immigrant generation, and that persist. Um, yes, I, I, I definitely tried to address that in the book. In fact, I had a very long, bloody battle with my editor um, <laughs> to keep in. I, so I have, in, in a couple of points in the book, I, I, I kind of look at the work that immigrants do, and then I look at the work their children do, and I compare that with the children. So I look at the native-born children of immigrants, and I compare them to the native-born children of native born and and show that you know what you have is not this quick step from you know kind of the bottom of the ladder to to being where just being native didn't get you the same jobs that the native born children of native born Americans had that it's it's quite it takes several generations and so it took me a big fight to keep that data in because my immigrants my the editor said Who's going to care about that? And I'm thinking, the Chiswicks. The Chiswicks will care. And so, so I, I managed to keep that in there and, and, uh, and, and footnote it quite uh, carefully. To, and I'm very proud of that data because historians, historians don't tend to put the stuff in that the economists will find satisfying. And the, and the economists tend not to write stories that the historians will find satisfying. And so... I tried to do both, so, so I hope you'll take a look at that and tell me what you think of it. <laughs> a gentleman right here in the middle. David Sobelson, Washington, D.C. 
Uh, I want to take that last question and bring us back to the A word of assimilation. Uh, assimilation really is a factor much more for the second and third generations than it is for the immigrant generation. And I want to know if you found significant, uh, especially occupational and professional differences uh, in terms of the second and third generation. I've heard, for instance, that some immigrant groups don't tend to go into politics, even in the second and third generation, the way others do. We all know about how the Irish and the Italians wound up dominating politics in some cities. Um, and do all immigrant groups in the second and third generation tend to have the same diverse occupations and professions, or are there some that, uh, for want of a better word, assimilate that way more than others? Um, so the second part of your question, I would say yes, there's definitely diversity among groups about how they assimilate economically. Uh, and I, I talked, and, and that's the, this, this part of the book I was referring to when I answered uh, Professor Chiswick's question. Um, and, and back to the, the, the first part of your, of your question about assimilation, uh, I, I definitely agree with what you're saying, that I think uh, assimilation is kind of a... Uh, not only a multi-generational story, but, but one that almost, in, in a way, is more pertinent to the native-born children of immigrants than it is of immigrants. Uh, and I, I talk in the, in the book, I, I give the place where I deal with that issue is with Italian immigrants and, and the fights between American-born uh, Italian-Americans and their parents about you know, what Italian-American, you know, high school students can do. And, uh, so far as what they should even eat for lunch at school. And the children are saying, you know, to their parents, I can't eat that meal you packed me. I'll be the laughing stock of the school if I eat that. And, and these children then, but the parents say, no, no, this is good food. You're eating this food. And so the, the kids then will take the food out of the house. They'll throw it away. They'll go buy a different meal that they'll eat in front of their, their you know, their non-Italian friends who they want to impress with their not being, you know, greenhorns. Um, in the far back there on the right, and then we'll get to the far back of the room. Thank you, Carl Henry Geschwind. I'd like to follow up on a previous question that asked about Pensacola or Chicago. I am asking, could this story have also been written about Toronto or Sydney, or is this something that makes this specifically American? Um, I mean, I think the answer is yes and no. So uh, on the one hand, um, you know, you look at, for example, you look at Italians, and Italians come to the United States, but Italians also go to South America uh, and to Canada, for that matter. Um, many more of them come to the United States, and... And so that, that does lead to the question of why. And there's definitely a perception. I mean, you can see the, the Italians, uh, with the Italians, there's definitely this perception by 1900 that um, if you're kind of a middle class Italian, the South America is a good place to go because you can become middle class there more easily. But if you're poor and Italian, <clears throat> the United States is a better place to go because you can make more money as a day laborer there than you can in South America or in Canada, so, so it's kind of a, a complicated, complicated answer, but I think the answer is both yes and no. And right next, we'll come up here. Uh, thank you. Not work. Oh, you're good now. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Dave Rabinowitz, and in California. The question of bilingual, multilingual education is a constant controversy. Was it like that in New York? Do you cover that in the book? So I ended up not covering that in the book um, because, primarily because it was not a very big issue in New York very often until the 1980s. 1980s and 1990s, it became, it became an issue. Um, for the most part, it wasn't. You find... Um, this expectation that you, 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 if you're an immigrant, you plunk your children into the school and they're going to learn English, you know, in a couple of months. And that was considered an okay thing for most of New York's history. Then by the 1980s and 90s, there was this sense that, 
that immigrant children were being left behind as a result of that, that, that many of them were failing, not graduating because of that. Um, this was especially the case with, with, because you have large numbers of teenage immigrants who are coming and, and they're not learning English as quickly in school as perhaps some other immigrants had. So it, it tends not to be as big a story as it is in other parts of the country until you know, that period where it becomes a, an issue all across the country. And I just heard that they're, they're thinking now of, of revoking the ban on bilingual education in California because the, the non-Latino parents want their kids to learn Spanish and want their kids to have Spanish immersion programs that, like we have in Arlington, but, but the, are, they're banned in California. So, so it's interesting how these things change. Good question here. Microphone's right here. Um, I'm curious. I know there was a play called Flower Drum Song that pertains to a previous question about, um, I believe, Japanese families that were moving into the San Francisco area and the uh, young children wanted to be hip like the kids that they were going to school with. And of course, the parents were saying, no, no, you can't do this, you know, uh, tradition and everything. And another question about, do you go, uh, in your book, do you go into working conditions and working in factories, long hours, uh, low pay, and how that impacted families? Um, yeah, I, I don't know much about your, the first question. The, New York has this remarkably tiny Japanese immigrant population and, and it never, it's never a significant part of New York's uh, population, uh, Japanese immigrants. So, so I, I learned very little about Japanese immigrants uh, doing my work. As far as the second, absolutely. I talk a lot about sweatshop conditions um, and even the pre-sweatshop conditions in the, where, where tenement work was the norm, as I showed in that picture. So yes, I have, I have quite a bit about that. I, I, don't, I don't know it. One, one last question, and this gentleman here has been <laughs> suffering. Put that guy up back there. Oh. Uh, Don Phillips, actually, two quick questions. Probably take a long time. But um, how, do you think that the attitude of the immigrant groups towards assimilation has changed over the period uh, that you reviewed? And uh, secondly, how has the path of citizenship or the process of citizenship changed over that period? See, that's a great, those are great questions. Um, the, the one about uh, immigrant attitudes towards assimilation I think is especially interesting. Um, what I have found stays the same for the most part is the attitude that among immigrants in New York that if your children become too American, it ruins them. That American values aren't as, as desirable as the values of the place they come from. And you find that with, with Irish immigrants in the 19th century, and you find that with, with immigrants today, and, and I, I have found that sentiment with, with most immigrant groups in between. Um, learning English is another matter. So, so, you know, parents will want their kids to learn English, but not so much that they'll then give up their, uh, those values. And then the path to citizenship, that's, that's also a good question. I talk about that at the very end of the book, how, how one of the great misconceptions about uh, illegal immigration today is, is well, why don't, the immigrants wait in why don't the illegal immigrants wait in line like my ancestors did? And, and I explain in the book that, that first of all, that, that most people's immigrant ancestors didn't wait in the line because there, there was no line. It was, you know, if you were medically, uh, you could pass the medical test, you could get into the country. And that whereas today, there is no line for most would-be immigrants because, uh, because of the 1965 law, if you, if you don't have a relative here, so most slots go to someone who has a relative already here. Most of the rest of the slots go to someone who has a very desirable skill, if you're a nurse, if you're a doctor. So if you're not a nurse or doctor or a professor, if you don't have a relative already here, there's n literally no line for you to get on. There is no way to legally immigrate, and that's... So, so that's a really important thing to understand that I feel like isn't very well understood. We have time for one last question. There's a hand right back there. Yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Steve Lipson. Uh, 
I'd be interested in what insights you have on Muslim immigrants or the role of 9-11 in New York's immigration history. And as a more specific question, if that helps, like since you've studied the know-nothings so extensively, uh, what do you see as the similarities and differences between like anti-Catholic prejudice in the 19th century and opposition to the so-called ground zero mosque or Islamophobia in the 21st? Yeah, um, I, talk, I talk a good deal uh, in the, at the end of the book about, about Muslim immigrants and about the impact of 9-11 on attitudes towards them. My feeling is that the attitudes towards Catholic immigrants in the 19th century and even in the beginning of the 20th century to some extent and attitudes towards, uh, towards Muslim immigrants today are you know, they're virtually identical. I mean, you can find, we're, you look at these quotes from of what people said about Catholics and how Catholics were a menace to American society, a threat to everything Americans hold dear. They want to destroy the nation. I mean, the kind of words that you see exactly said about Muslim immigrants today. Uh, so, so I see those as, as, as very, very similar. Um, and, and kind of some of the rhetoric you see about, about the, that mosque uh, the, the, or Muslim community center near 9-11, very similar to what you saw about the building of convents in, in uh, antebellum the United States. So, so I see those as very, very, very similar. Thank you. Let me just say that there are copies of the book City of Dreams outside. Tonight is Halloween. That means it's the beginning of the holiday shopping season. <laughs> And I can tell you that uh, this is a book that you or your relatives might uh, actually appreciate reading. Uh, the narrative uh, that Tyler provides, I think, is absolutely compelling and fascinating. And you don't have to blame, believe me. You can believe Philip Roth uh, and Kevin Baker, both of whom blurb the book um, uh, on the back uh, of, of, the, uh, of the cover there. Um, there's a light reception right outside, right uh, after this session. And you should join us next week. Uh, if you are anxious about the election and you need to spend it thinking about something else other than the future of the country, uh, you can join us uh, next Monday when Amanda Moniz will be speaking of, on From Empire to Humanity, the American Revolution, and the Origins of Humanitarianism. Thank you to our participants in the seminar. Thank you, Tyler Andine.